Party organization. The major parties of the United States have a decentralized structure, and the different parts and elements work together primarily during national elections. The parties themselves have been in decline or losing influence since the 1960s. Here are some words you're going to need to know. Ward, precinct, and split ticket voting. The two major parties are often described as though they were highly organized, close-knit, well-disciplined uh, groups. However, neither party is anything of the kind. Rather, both are highly decentralized, fragmented, disjointed, and often beset with, by factions and internal squabbling. Neither party has a chain of command running from the national through the state to the local level. Each of the state party organizations is only loosely tied to the party's national structure. By the same token, local party organizations are often quite independent of their parent state organization. These various party units usually cooperate with one another, of course, but that is not always the case. The president's party is usually more solidly united and more cohesively organized than the, than the opposing party. The president is automatically the party leader. He asserts that leadership with such tools as, uh, as his access to the media, his popularity, and his power to make appointments to federal offices and to dispense other favors. The other party has no one even, even uh, a fairly com comparable position. Indeed, in the American party system, there is seldom any one person in the opposition party who can truly be called its leader. Rather, a number of personalities, frequently in competition with one another, form a loosely identifiable leadership group in, that, in the party out of power. <clears throat> Federalism is one major reason for the decentralized nat nature of the two major political parties. Remember, the basic goal of the major parties is to gain control of the government. They try to do this by winning elective offices. Today, there are more than a half a million elective offices in the United States. In the American federal system, those offices are widely distributed at the national, the state, and the local levels. In short, because the governmental system is decentralized, giving many powers to states and localities, so too are the major parties that serve it. The nominating process is also a major uh, cause of party decentralization. Um, the nominating process has a central role in the life of political parties. You'll consider the selection of candidates at some length later on, but for now look at two related aspects of that process. First, candidate selection is an intra-party process. That is, nominations are made within the party. Second, the nominating process can be, and often is, a divisive one. Where there is a fight over a nomination, that contest pits members of the same party against one another. Republicans fight Republicans. Democrats battle Democrats. In short, the prime function of the major parties the making of nominations is also a prime cause of their highly fragmented character. The structure of both major parties at the national level has four basic elements. These elements are the National Convention, the National Committee, the National Chairperson, and the Congressional Campaign Committees. The National Convention is often described as the party's national voice. The convention meets in the summer of every presidential election year to nominate the party's presidential and vice presidential candidates. It also performs some other functions, including the adoption of the party's rules and the writing of its platform. Beyond that, the convention has little authority. It has no control over the selection of the party's candidates for other offices, nor over the policy stands those nominees take. You will take a longer look at both parties' national nominating committees later, in conventions later. Between conventions, the party's affairs are handled, at least in theory, by the National Committee and by the National Chairperson. For years, each party's National Committee was composed of a committeeman and a committee woman from each state and several of the territories. They were chosen by the state party organization. However, in recent years, both parties have expanded the committee's membership. Today, the Republican National Committee, RNC, also seats several of the party's chairpersons in each state, the District of Columbia, Guam, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. 
Representatives of such GOP-related groups as the National Federation of Republican Women also serve on the RNC. The Democratic National Committee, DNC, is an even larger body. In addition to the committeemen and women from each state, it now includes the party's chairperson and vice person of each state and the several territories. It also includes additional members from the party organizations of the larger states, and up to 75 at-large members chosen by the DNC itself. Several members of Congress, as well as governors, mayors, and young, Republic, uh, excuse me, young Democrats also have seats. On paper, the National Committee appears to be a powerful organization loaded with many of the party's leading figures. In fact, it does not have a great deal of clout. Most of its work centers on staging the party's national convention every four years. The National Chairperson. In each party, the National Chairperson is the leader of the National Committee. In form, he or she is chosen to a four-year term by the National Committee at a meeting held right after the National Convention. In fact, the choice is made by the just-nominated presidential candidate and is then ratified by the National Committee. The National Chairperson directs the work of the party's headquarters and its small staff in Washington. In presidential election years, the committee's attention is focused on the National Convention and then the campaign. In between presidential elections, the chairperson and the committee work to strengthen the party and its fortunes. They do so by promoting party unity, raising money, recruiting new voters, and otherwise preparing for the next presidential season. The Congressional Campaign Committees. Each party also has a campaign committee in each House of Congress. These committees work to re-elect incumbents and to make sure that their seats uh, that seats given up by retiring party members remain in the party. The committees also take a hand in the selecting candidates to unseat incumbents in the other party, at least in those House or Senate races where the chances for success seem to justify such efforts. In both parties and in both houses, the members of those campaign committees are chosen by their colleagues. They serve two years, that is, the term of Congress. National party organization is largely the product of custom and of rules adopted by the national conventions. At the state and local levels, however, party structure is largely set by state law. At the state level, party machinery is built around a state central committee headed by a state chairperson. A chairperson may be an important political figure in his or her own right. More often than not, however, the chairperson fronts for the governor a U.S. Senator or some other powerful leader or group in the politics of the state. Together the chairperson and the Central Committee work to further this, the party's interest in the state. Most of the time they attempt to do this by building an effective organization and party unity, finding candidates and campaign funds and so forth. Remember however both major parties are highly decentralized, fragmented, and sometimes torn by struggles for power. This can complicate the chairperson and the committee's job. Local party structures vary so widely that they, they nearly defy even a brief description. Generally, they follow the electoral map of the state, with a party unit for each state, uh, each district in which elective offices are to be filled. Congressional and legislative districts, counties, cities, and towns, wards, and precincts. A ward is a unit into which cities are often divided for the election of city council members. A precinct is the smallest unit of election administration. The voters in each precinct report to one polling place. In most larger cities, a party's organization is further broken down by residential blocks and sometimes even by apartment buildings. In such places, local party organizations are active year-round, but most often they are inactive except for those few hectic months before an election. The three components of the party. There is another way to look at the structure of the two major parties, the roles of their members. From this perspective, the parties are made up of three basic and closely interrelated components. One, the party organization. These are the leaders, the activists, and the hangers-on who control and run the party machinery. Two, the party in the electorate. This consists of the party's loyalists who vote the straight-ticket 
or usually vote for its candidates. And three, the party in government. These are the party's officeholders at all levels of government. Political parties have never been very popular in this country. Rather, over time, most Americans have had very mixed feelings about them. Most of us have accepted parties as necessary institutions, but at the same time, people feel that they should be closely watched and controlled. To many, political parties have seemed a little better than necessary evils. Political parties have been in a, in a period of decline since at least the late, the late 1960s. Their decline has led some analysts to conclude that the parties are not only in serious trouble, but that the party system itself may be at the point of collapse. The present weakened state of the parties can be traced to several factors. They include, one, a sharp drop in the number of voters willing to identify themselves as Republican or Democrats, and a growing number who regard themselves as independents. Two, a big increase in split ticket voting, or voting for candidates of different parties for different offices at the same election. Three, various structural changes and reforms that have made the parties more open, but have also led to greater internal conflict and disorganization. These changes range from the introduction of the direct primary in the early 1900s to recent and far-reaching changes in campaign finance laws. Four, changes in the technology of campaigning, especially the heavy use of television and of the internet, professional campaign managers and direct mail advertising. These changes have made candidates much less dependent on party organizations since in many cases they can now speak directly to the electorate. Five, the growth of single issue organizations. These interest groups take sides for or against candidates based on the group's views in some specific area of public policy. One way such groups are making their presence felt is through political action committees, PACs. PACs raise and distribute money to candidates who will further their goals. In that way, PACs have lessened candidates' reliance on party organization for financial support. You will look at the matters affecting the condition of the parties later on. As you do so, remember that political parties are indispensable to democratic government. The major American parties have existed longer than has any other party anywhere in the world. And as you have seen, the major parties perform a number of necessary functions. In short, reports of their passing may be premature and may even be far-fetched.